Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Gallifer Tri Holdings PLC Half Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we will notify you by email when they are ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll and we'd be very grateful uh, for your attention. And I'd now like to hand over to Bill Hocking, CEO, and Andrew Duxbury, CFO of Gallifer Tri. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. Right. Well, thanks for joining everybody. Um, I'm going to take you through a slightly shortened version of the half year presentation. Then, of course, we'll take any questions. So I'll get straight on with it. Um, the, the, the slide you see there in the, in the picture um, is a sports science facility we built for Leeds Beckett University. Uh, it's a great building. <clears throat> and typical of the sort of things that we build all the time. That red, red cube on the top there is actually a 100 meter long running track that runs down the length of the building and filled with all sorts of uh, electronic gizmos to, uh, to monitor the athletes. So really impressive building. Thanks, Juan. Okay, so here are our highlights for the half year. We've made really good progress in the half year. We've been fully operational across all of our sites with uh, productivity close to normal. And I say close to normal because apart from a few people and the occasional uh, gang going off to have to isolate and so on, um, it's gone pretty smoothly. And, uh, and as I said on the main presentation uh, last week, thanks to all of our staff, subcontractors and, and clients for working to, together so well over this period and keeping the whole thing on an even keel. I'm very pleased to report a return to profitability uh, with an operating margin you see there of 1.6% and uh, delighted to be back on the dividend list with a dividend of 1.2p. So a really good half year, revenue down slightly in the, in the period, and Andrew will take you through the numbers in a bit more detail. But overall, in a nutshell, we've got a really strong balance sheet, and coupled with a high quality order book, 3.3 billion pounds a year gives us confidence for the future. So if I just take you through the financial performance, and as, and as Bill has already said, it's really pleasing for us to report our return to profitability. And really importantly as well, that, that is a clean number. So there's no exceptional items in there. That's bang in line with our expectations. And it means that we are on track for our full year targets. We set the targets out in September and Bill will come on to those uh, a little bit later on. You can see on the slide, revenue um, is a little bit lower than this time last year, but it is in line with our expectations. And as I say, it's on track for our full year target. And then we'll start to grow that revenue number again from, from next year. The reduction really reflects two things. One is um, our focus on core sectors, our selective approach to bidding to make sure that we take on the right type of contracts. And in particular as well in our infrastructure business, our water business is transitioning from the asset management program, the sixth asset management program, AMP6, into the seventh program. And there's always a, a slight dip and a hiatus as we transition from one program to the other. And that's reflected in the revenue numbers this period. But overall, as I say, the revenue is bang in line with our, with our forecast and our expectations. Similarly, our margin, the operating uh, profit, 3.9 million pounds, and our operating profit uh, in the divisions was 1.6% across building and infrastructure. And both building and infrastructure showed really strong improvement in the half year. And that 1.6% margin is in line with our expectations for the year. And again, there's good opportunity for us to grow that further um, in line with our medium term goals. Profit before tax was 4.1 million pounds and due to our relatively low tax rate because of uh, some previous losses, our earnings per share are 3.4 pence and as Bill has said, coming on to a, a dividend of 1.2 pence. I should just mention as well, you can see it on the penultimate bullet point on the slide, that because of our strong performance, Bill's mentioned we've been open through the whole financial year, uh, we've taken the decision to repay the furlough money that was received during this financial year. We had some small amount, about one and a half million pounds of receipts through July and August that we are now in the process of repaying. Moving on to the balance sheet, our balance sheet remains very strong. We remain a very well capitalized business. And this is important and a real differentiator for us in the marketplace, both for our clients 
and for the subcontractors who work for us. They want to work with, with strong companies as well. We've got good cash position. Average month end cash is £158 million. Pounds. Bill and I focus entirely on that average month end rather than the year end position. It's much more illustrative of the overall state of the company. And importantly, we've got no debt, we've got no pension liabilities, and also we've got no supplier financing arrangements. So that is a really clean and strong balance sheet position. Importantly as well, through that cash number, although that's grown in the period of good cash generation, we've also improved our payment performance to our supply chain. And that's really important to us. Dealing with the supply chain fairly through the COVID disruption is important to bring that cultural alignment and bring the supply chain closer to the business because they're so important for us in delivering our objectives. And finally, you can see on the slide, our PPP portfolio is valued at 44 million pounds. This is a portfolio of PFI assets, and that generates for us interest income returning about eight to 10% to our bottom line each year. And Bill's mentioned the reinstatement of dividends. So pulling the strands together of the strong balance sheet, the encouraging trading in the period, our quality order book and the outlook, and the fact we're trading in line with our targets has given the board the confidence to do two things. Firstly, to reinstate the dividends, and secondly, to improve the dividend policy. And we've done that by improving the dividend cover from previously three times earnings to a range of two to two and a half times. And we've also said that we will keep that under review as we go forward to see if there's opportunity to reduce that cover further. And as a result, you can see the interim dividend declared of 1.2 pence per share. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, so this is just a, a reminder of what Gallagher Try is about. Our purpose is to improve uh, people's lives by safely and sustainably constructing the social and economic uh, infrastructure that communities and, of course, the country at the moment needs. And in going about this, we aspire to be a people-orientated, progressive, values-driven business that predictably delivers for our stakeholders. <clears throat> uh, this is an overview of our business model. Uh, we have our purpose there on the left, which I've just gone through. And we approach the market uh, with the philosophy of safety and construction, safety in use, of course, very pertinent at the moment, particularly delivering high quality projects to repeat clients with a strong focus on risk management, commercial management, and modern methods of construction. Over there to the, to the segment section, we focused on building an infrastructure with 90% out of our revenues through the public and regulated sector frameworks, and the remainder with blue chip private clients. And all with an aim towards gener generating cash and margin to fund growth, return value to shareholders, and of course, contribute to society through the social value that we generate. Um, ESG sustainability runs through everything that we do. Uh, we have a code of conduct, simply called doing the right thing, that provides uh, guidance to all of our staff and our supply chain. Uh, I'll just pick on some of these statistics here. The, the top one there, safety. The safety of, our, of everyone on our site is absolutely paramount, paramount in everything that we do. And I'm really pleased to see our AFR our accident frequency rate uh, improve again to 0 0.06, which is a very good performance in the industry, notwithstanding the fact, of course, that we aspire to zero uh, on, on that line. And we work very hard to, uh, in pursuit of that goal. Um, we measure our scope one and two carbon emissions. Those are those emissions that we can control directly. Our cars, for example, our, our, our buildings and so on. Uh, and we're working hard on understanding and getting better at monitoring uh, the scope three emissions, which are embedded and whole life carbon emissions from the project we build. Um, we're busy developing our whole sustainability strategy alongside the broader corporate strategy, which we'll publish later on in the year. Thanks. Moving on to our markets, uh, our markets remain resilient. Uh, and, and as Andrew said, it has held up well through the, through the pandemic. Uh, we expect the government's levelling up in zero net carbon objectives to underpin growth in the construction sector over the medium term. Um, the medium, the, sorry, the recently constructed, construct, uh, recently published, apologies, construction playbook um, is in essence a far more mature approach by government as to how they approach uh, construction and build in a more sustainable way of contracting uh, through public sector procurement, which we welcome, which, which plays well to our strengths. Our build, uh, building order book you see there is £2 billion, and the constituent parts of it are on the left-hand side there. Uh, all of these sectors continue to provide a robust pipeline of work with the Education and Schools Funding Agency 
uh, uh, DIO, the, the Defense Infrastructure Organization, and the NHS, our biggest clients. And our order book there at 400 odd million pounds has grown organically in the period. Thanks, Andrew. In infrastructure, we also have a very resilient sector here. The order book stands, as you can see, there at 1.3 billion pounds. And we have excellent uh, framework positions with Highways England and various local authorities. Uh, we've just been awarded last week a 48 million pound scheme uh, by Lincolnshire County Council following the successful opening of, our, of a Lincoln Eastern Bypass product, uh, project before Christmas. And then in environment there, we have two further frameworks with uh, Thames Water in the period and anticipate further framework awards in the sector uh, by the end of this uh, full year. Thanks, Andrew. So these markets provide an order book which stands all together at 3.3 billion pounds, up 100 billion, 100 million, sorry, 100 billion, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> 100 million on the previous period. 87% um, of this is in frameworks in the public and regulated sectors, uh, broadly similar to the previous period. Uh, and the private sector you see there is predominantly PRS, private rental sector, and uh, student residences with some commercial office buildings as well. Um, our disciplined approach to project selection and risk management is reflected through the, through the order book you see there in terms of its blue chip client base, uh, sensible terms and conditions, embedded risk profile, embedded cash, things like that. And so the order book quantum and the duration of that order book is what really underpins our strategy. And it highlights the importance of our, our strong framework position. Most of this year's revenue is secured. And as you can see there, we have 76% of next year's revenue already secured, which is a good position to be at this time of the year. Here, so here's a bit more detail on our, on our risk management process. And this underlies our order book and everything that's in it. So what happens is our business unit managing directors uh, review potential tenders using a defined process uh, to identify any onerous contract conditions or risks. And if any of these arise, uh, and if the BU still wants to proceed, then the project comes to an exec meeting, which we, we meet monthly to look at these bids and decide whether the bid can uh, progress or not. Um, if it does, uh, we will either then stop the bid or allow it to progress on strict sort of risk mitigating parameters. But the really important thing here is that the culture of the, of the business has evolved to the point where very few projects uh, will come up to the exec now because the business units reject them on the basis of uh, a poor risk profile before they get anywhere near us. So it's really working well in that regard. And then the bottom line there, commercial control and reporting. Once we're in contract, we have robust project controls uh, to manage and overview the project forecasts. And in addition, we have a system what we call uh, commercial health checks, whereby uh, operational and commercial directors from another part of the business spend a couple of days on another region's project uh, to, to review that project, the forecast, uh, and to give their view on the likely outcome. And again, I'm pleased that the culture of the business uh, means that these health checks are now welcomed by the receiving site and any recommendations or observations uh, by the visiting directors are are taken seriously and acted upon and reflected through the forecast. So this is really working well for us overall. So putting all this together, um, what we mean uh, by the long term, or sorry, the medium term KPIs there, the third column, uh, these are unchanged apart from, uh, from the previous period, apart from uh, the increase in the divisional operating margin to more than two and a half percent. And that's based on the performance of our current project. So we, we encouraged by uh, our current performance and have raised our sites from two to more than two and a half percent over the medium term. Uh, the revenue range there of 1.2 to 1.5 billion remains valid as we continue to focus on bottom line quality of earnings and not top line revenue growth. Thanks. Okay. And so in summary then everyone, uh, we've made really good progress in the half year, which gives us confidence in the longer term performance of the business. We have a really strong balance sheet, no debt, no pension fund liability, and an excellent order book, uh, which I've just described, with all the attributes that we need for success. Um, we're really happy to return to profitability and return to the dividend list with a more generous dividend policy. Uh, overall, our markets are supportive, uh, and we're on track to meet our full year targets and confident for the future. So that was a quick uh, overview of the presentation, everyone, and we'll now move on to take any questions. That's very kind of you. Thank you to Bill and Andrew. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions. 
using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review investor questions submitted already today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, uh, Andrew, Bill, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, obviously, investors had the ability to pre-submit questions in advance of today's meeting. We received three questions that I'd like just to perhaps start off the Q&A with. The first question, um, and if I hand over to you guys to, to pick up, given the impact of COVID, does the market present any M&A opportunities to accelerate your growth? Um, well, we're not looking at any specific M&A opportunities. Um, uh, I think COVID has... Um, from an industry perspective, what happened through COVID is that the whole industry was very uh, focused on, on keeping the industry on an even keel. So it was all about cash flowing through from uh, tier one clients and, and particularly government through tier one and making sure that the tier one contractors continue to pay their supply chain. And that way, everything is kept in an even keel and gives the industry the ability to bounce back. So that was coordinated by the Construction Leadership Council in 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 uh, in uh, with uh, with the Cabinet Office of Bays, um, and has succeeded very well actually. So actually, you know, the balance sheets of most of our supply chain are, are reasonably robust, and there's been no specific opportunities for MA that comes out of the back of COVID. I think that's the uh, answer. There. I think that's right, and we would always focus on. M&A, which is in line with the strategy that Bill's, Bill's outlined, yeah. as, as opposed to M&A for its own sake. It's about M&A, which fits our strategy of bottom line, yeah. quality growth. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the second question we received was, how do you see future infrastructure spending driving revenues? And what is the sales cycle into such projects? Well, the infrastructure pipeline is, is very robust. Um, it was there up on the slides. And of course, we don't we don't address the whole infrastructure market. We very concentrate on, on roads or highways and, and environment, which is predominantly water and wastewater. Um, so those pipelines are robust. The water companies do the five-year or six-year in Scotland regulatory period, and that's a, a robust pipeline. Uh, and in Highways England and local authority roads, again, a very robust pipeline. I mean, Highways England's got some £27 billion uh, in, in their budget. So that's all holding up well. The cycle... Um, you know, roads, less, less so water, but roads have quite a long sort of gestation period. Uh, the roads that, that um, we're involved in, we, we've got a few on the ground, of course, but um, we've got a further six roads project that start up uh, in the next sort of six to, six to 12 months on the ground. Um, so we're working on those. We've probably had those in the books for best part of a year already, I'm guessing. So they have quite a long gestation period to get through the whole statutory approvals process and then the final design and into contracting. So the cycle is... It does have a bit of a lag, I suppose, in it, but that lag is really built into the order book. I, I might just add as well on, on, I mean, that's very much on our infrastructure market. Of course, the, the our building market is still heavily based on public spending in terms of education, defense, healthcare, as, as Bill's touched on. And typically, those projects will have a shorter gestation period, yeah. quicker to ground. So, new primary schools, secondary schools, and so on uh, can be to ground and, and, and completed over a, you know, a shorter period, perhaps a, a sort of Yes, six to twelve months lead in and a kind of eighteen month build program. So, so a, a shorter sales cycle in the in the building business. That's great. Thank you very much. The final question that was pre-submitted was, "What do you see as the optimal level for margins?" <laughs> as high as possible. No, I think I think you know people talk about industry standard margins of uh, sort of between two and a half and three and a half percent, and and uh, if you'd been around a few years ago, that that language has moved quite a lot. You know, it's moved from two to two and a half to three. And now the, the range that people are talking about is two and a half. I suppose two and a half to three is, is the most, uh, is the normal. Uh, what we've said is more than two and a half. So that's what I think the answer is. And, and, and I think it's, that is achievable with the, with the risk profile that we're, we're looking to, to, to achieve. Because that's the balance. It's about making sure we get sufficient margin without pricing ourselves out. That's right. But making sure that we get the right margin commensurate with our risk profile. So. Bill, Andrew, thank you very, very much indeed for that. So that takes care of those that were pre-submitted. Um, if I could ask you both to just select the Q&A tab, you'll see investors have submitted questions um, throughout the presentation. Could I ask you possibly to read out the question and, and where appropriate, give a response, and then I'll pick up from you uh, at the end. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. 
Yeah, no, we'll do. So I'll read out the questions and then Bill or I will both will okay. let, we'll, we'll do our best to answer those. So the first question is, what do we think sets us apart from our competitors when tendering from new, for new contracts? Okay. And, and what do we see as the greatest risk to the business moving forward? I mean, when, when it very much depends on the client, but most, most clients and most of our clients in the public and regulated sectors, and indeed uh, with the blue chip private sector clients, are very focused on quality. So they look at uh, the quality of our people, you know, what team is going to build whatever they want built, uh, and, and um, do they have the right culture, the right track record, the right experience, et cetera, et cetera. They look at the strength of our balance sheet because our clients uh, want comfort that the companies that they're choosing to construct uh, whatever it is they're building is going to be around to see it through. And that's really important, by the way, in terms of our supply chain as well, because our sub subcontractors also want to work for companies with strong balance sheets that they trust. Um, and then it's about how long it's going to take and, and the actual physical proposals. And I would say that typically um, uh, clients are looking at probably 70% of their of their appraisal is based on the sort of quality questions, people, track record, balance sheet, specific proposals for the project, and probably 20 or 30% on the commercial, of which there's terms and conditions and all sorts of other things. So, so I think that's what sets us aside, our people, our culture, our balance sheet. And should, should, should I pick up on the, the, the risks of business going forward? I think for me, there's probably two, two things to raise um, in a similar vein, of course. One is people, and, and the other is is the, the right order book. So by people, you know, actually we need the right people right through the organization. We spend a huge amount of time investing in early careers, so that's graduates, apprentices and trainees, and in development of our people throughout the organization, developing their own skills and so on. And, and just to give you an example, through, through the COVID disruption, we've spent a, a lot of time uh, on well-being. So as well as the physical safety on site, we've spent a huge amount of time on on well-being, helping people to work through the, these unusual situations. So, so make sure we keep the right people. And then in terms of order book, making sure we've signed the right contracts, bring the right contracts into the order book, because you know, if, if we, if we um, lose our discipline in that, then, then of course what that does is that undermines our, our projections going forward. So, so keeping our discipline and keeping our good people, I would say, are, the, yeah. are, are, are critical to moving forward. Yeah. So moving on to the next question. Um, what can we expect with regards to new business coming through post-pandemic and how can we flex the business to take advantage of this? Um, I, I think that our, our pipeline is pretty much the same as it has been. Uh, as, as we said, we, we're very focused on the public sector and the regulated sector. Those pipelines are pretty consistent and we don't expect them to change. In fact, we see a, a gentle uh, uptick, I think, uh, which is good for us, by the way. A, a massive tsunami of new work isn't good for anybody. A nice, gentle, manageable uptick is, is, is far better for the for the industry and, and for us, obviously. So I don't think there's any, going to be any particular change there, personally. Okay. And, and, then, and then very similar, are there new market segments we're looking to expand into? And how does our current order book convert into contracted work? Let me just cover off the second of those first. So the current order book is contracted work. Behind that order book and, and outside of that 3.3 billion, there is a pipeline of other work that we are currently tendering, which we will look to convert to get that contracted, and then that will come into the order book. So the order book is work that will be delivered on the ground. And I think in terms of market sectors, we are very happy that we are in the right market sectors at the moment, education, defense, health, commercial space, highways, water. And of course, we regularly keep that under review. We're very satisfied that those are all markets with good growth opportunities at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a couple of longer questions here, which I, I will just take in in, uh, in part if that's okay. Uh, so the first bill, perhaps just tell us how we intend to improve margins over the medium term. Yeah, so, so margins, look, the basis of good margins is all about having the right jobs in the first place. And hence our focus on risk management in, in what we do, and as I, as I always say, more importantly, what we don't do. So, so once we get the order book to the stage where we have got it now, where everything in that order book is the type of work that we can do day in and day out, we've got the people, we've got the experience, we've got the supply chain, we can do that confidently. Uh, and, and while I'm saying there's never going to be issues in construction, because that wouldn't be correct, the magnitude of those issues will, will not be material across a portfolio of 200 to 250 odd projects. So some will be slightly up and some will be slightly down, and most of them will be in a pretty narrow band. And that's what we aim to achieve, predictability with no surprises. Um, so, so, so that's the first thing about improving margins. The second thing is about people. So it's having the right people with the right skill sets, the right culture, the right attitude. We spend a lot of time 
on bringing the right people into the com uh, com company, uh, inducting them properly, training them properly, and put a huge focus on uh, on sustainability, obviously, and also around project management and commercial management skills. Uh, then we've got a, um, a relationship with our supply chain, which is really important. So it's called Advantage to Alignment. That gives our supply chain, the biggest supply chain partners, access to our pipeline, access to our training, and brings them closer to the, com uh, the company um, in terms of culture and in terms of uh, aptitude. So, so that's really important. And then all of these things go together with safe, efficient delivery, modern methods of construction, the use of digital platforms and all things like that uh, to, to come around the circle and, and to for us to deliver high quality projects on time to satisfy clients. Uh, that's how we raise our, our, our margins. So there's no rocket science in all of that. There's lots of attributes to it, of course, uh, but it's just good solid business. Thank you. And in terms of our carbon footprint, perhaps just an example of how we're uh, looking to reduce our carbon footprint. Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of different parts to carbon, of course. Scope one and two carbon emissions are about the, the emissions that we can control. So, uh, for example, in this building, we, we have a green energy tariff. Uh, our company, Car Fleet, more than a thousand cars. We're busy greening that fleet by having more and more electric and hybrid vehicles. And, and, and heading towards 40% of that fleet now is is uh, pure electric or, or hybrid. Um, and that's a good example because a few years ago, our, our emissions, average emissions across the fleet were 133 grams of carbon per kilometer. That's now something like 86 grams of carbon per kilometer. And we forecast it being 35 grams of carbon by 2025. So that's really good in terms of driving carbon out of the, biz uh, out of the business. And it's also good in saving money because uh, we're also saving hundreds of thousands of pounds in, in, in petrol and diesel costs by moving to electric, electric vehicles. So that's a good example of driving carbon and cost out of the business. Uh, and then scope three emissions are, are the um, more difficult ones, to be frank. It's, it's the embedded carbon in the buildings that we, we build and the whole life carbon performance of those buildings. But again, we're working hard on that and we're very supportive of the government's 2050 targets. Uh, a couple of examples, we built two nursery schools up in Scotland recently. One was built to a very green standard, passive house standards, and one was built traditionally, uh, and we're looking at measuring the embedded carbon in both of those buildings and in the, the, um, the operational carbon that each uses to get a, a good idea of how they actually perform in real life uh, and, and, and obviously look for areas to improve. Okay. And then actually this, this question links to the previous uh, answer around uh, what measures are undertaken to improve productivity through the use of new technology? Yeah. Well, we certainly do that. I think we, I don't think, I know, we, we certainly in the forefront of BIM in the, in the building industry in, in, in the UK. Um, we use virtual reality in a number of uh, arenas. Um, one really important one actually is safety. So we've, we've got a whole, we've, we've made a whole lot of uh, 3D um, uh, short films, for want of a better description, in various environments. So a rail environment, a building environment, a road environment, and so on. And we use these from a safety perspective to induct people onto our site. So the, the people can put on their virtual reality glasses and be transported as it is into a, a 3D highways project and all sorts of stuff happens to raise their um, awareness of the potential hazards on our site. So we use that sort of technology for safety. We use um, you know building information modeling, 3D modeling, clash detection, all these sorts of things and how we design our buildings. And the technology is fantastic now. You can put on the glasses again and walk through these buildings now. Uh, to, and, and, and obviously our clients like that so they can see where they're getting. But we also use it very practically to look at where things are, the layout, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, yes, we certainly do a lot of, of pretty high-tech stuff for us uh, in the business. Yeah, no, I agree. And then finally, I'll cover this one. From Sorry, finally, from this, uh, uh, this particular um uh, questioner, could I give a brief summary of why an investor should consider looking at the company now? I think probably I would give you four reasons. The first is the markets are very strong at the moment. The tailwinds across you know, from government, across all of the sectors that we've talked about, there's huge opportunities in those markets at the moment. Um, secondly, it's really about our discipline and risk management. And Bill's talked about this a huge amount, but this is about us making sure that we are bidding for the contracts which we know we can deliver and then delivering those and managing those properly through the organization. I think the third one is about the balance sheet strength, and the balance sheet includes both cash and the PFI assets, which are included on that balance sheet, and those are good quality liquid assets if we, if we wanted to trade those in the secondary market. 
And then finally, the fourth reason, really about the growth opportunity. So our revenue will grow, our bottom line margin will grow faster, and then with the dividend cover, our dividend will grow faster still. So actually, there's a real opportunity uh, for investors coming in. Yeah. Uh, moving on, so the next question is, have we completed the right sizing of the overhead since the transaction? Um, the simple answer to that is that we have. Of course, there's a little bit more to do uh, as we as we look to change our um, office footprint and move to uh, more efficient and cheaper offices. Uh, but we have right sized the organization, but we continue and continually focus on overhead to make sure that our overhead stays at the right level. Um, I think we've covered the next question, which is confidence that our margin targets of 2.5% are realistic. Yeah. Uh, I think we've largely covered that. The question does ask about the split of revenue between public and regulated sector um, and whether that will carry on into the delivery rather than the order book. And I think the answer to that is that it does. So our order book and the and the actual percentage of revenue that we that we trade are very similar in terms of those, in terms of those percentages. The third question, Bill, I assume there's no cladding issues identified from building divisions past work. Uh, well, um, obviously, in, in the light of Grenfell, the morning after Grenfell, we just assembled a task force to look at this very issue. Uh, and there were a few small issues which have been sorted. There's there's one uh, building left that is currently being, um, the cladding is being changed, this, this uh, composite cladding is being taken off and changed. That's uh, being paid for by insurance, actually. That's the only one we have. Yeah. And then the final question from this uh, questioner uh, is how many analysts are following the company and is it only company appointed brokers? Uh, so we currently have three uh, covering analysts plus Capital Access Group who, who provide um, uh, summary notes as well. And they are not all company appointed brokers. So, for example, Liberum uh, write on us and they are not uh, appointed by the company. OK, next question. Um, if we were to look to raise funding in the future, um, how would we make sure that shareholders are given a fair opportunity to participate alongside institutional investors? Perhaps I'll just answer that, Bill. Um, so, yeah, we have no plans to raise funds. Our balance sheet is is very strong. Uh, as we said, we've got cash position of an average cash of one hundred fifty eight million pounds at the at month end. Plus, we've got forty four million pound um, PFI portfolio of assets on the balance sheet. So, we we think that sets the company well and strongly for the future and for our plans. Um, and actually, you know, that also gives us the confidence to return capital through our dividend policy. So we are not expecting to, to re require additional funding in the future. Of course, you know, if that were to change, then we would absolutely make sure we did that on a, on a fair basis. Um, the next question, could you tell us what your average payment time is to suppliers and how this has changed over time? So, uh, and yes is the answer. So our average payment in the last uh, uh, six months was we paid 92% of our invoices uh, within uh, 60 days. Our average payment days were across our tour. Uh, we've got two entities. It was just, just under 40 days across, on average, across the two companies. What, what's really important is our supply chain value as treating them fairly and paying when we said we'll pay, and we're in the, in the upper quartile in terms of paying two terms. So that's setting the expectation and paying in line with that expectation. Those numbers that I've just referenced have improved, so our average days to pay have reduced uh, by, by two or three days over the last six months, and our percentage of uh, invoices paid within 60 days improved by from 86% to 92%, so a really strong increase in the number of invoices being paid within 60 days and we expect that to improve further during 2021 that's very important for us we're spending a huge amount of time on uh, in improving our processes so we will continue to make sure we pay the supply chain fairly and on time bill andrew i think that's that's pretty much most of if not all of the questions that have been submitted by investors uh, during the call today and thank you to uh, everyone that has taken the time to submit questions both ahead of the event and, and during the event um obviously we'll publish these questions we'll transcribe them and make them available to investors and you will receive an email uh, from us notifying you when they're ready and um, perhaps bill andrew i could just ask you for a few um closing comments i know investor feedback is important to you and of course we'll divert investors to give feedback um, after you have closed. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I've, I've enjoyed the session and thank you to everybody for, for joining. Um, uh, I think it's been good and the questions were good. So thanks very much and keep safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, the feedback page will appear. But if you access this meeting via the link, link sent to you by email, you'll simply be asked to log in uh, to submit your feedback. If you could give the company your thoughts and your views and expectations, I'm sure they will be warmly received. On behalf of the management team of Gallifer Tri, we'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all. Thank you once again.